joining us and being here for this really exciting session. Um, I, it, again, building on um, some in introductory work we did in the festival, this is going to be a really interesting uh, way of uh, taking what was introduced there and building on it so that you can use some of that um, excellent learning and apply it uh, to your projects and change management. So um, I'm just going to quickly do some housekeeping. So Welcome to the session. Um, it's going to be interactive. So please, um, there's going to be polls. There's going to be a survey to do at the end. Um, please ask questions. We will get question and answers done um, at the end of the session. Um, and uh, uh, please uh, say hello and introduce yourself in the chat. Um, it's really great for everybody to get to know each other. And then uh, without further ado, I will uh, introduce you to the session. So uh, this session is uh, discovering uh, uh, how neuroscience and practical tools can deliver change. And to take us uh, into the first part of the session, I will introduce, introduce you to Dr. Tammy Watchhorn, um, who uh, some of you will know from the festival, who uh, delivered the amazing five-day hackathon uh, that we had then. And uh, we're really lucky that uh, we've got her back again today uh, for lots of amazing innovation and insights. So uh, welcome, Tam, and thank you for joining us. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm just going to share my screen before we get going. There we go. So thank you for having me back, Joe. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Tibise Vera, who is going to um, uh, take part in the presentation as well. So the aims and objectives of this session is to introduce the concept of using neuroscience for change. Uh, Joe gave us this challenge earlier in the year and we have been using it in earnest ever since. We're going to introduce the contents of a practical hands-on programme that we've been using for changing brain biology and helping to facilitate change, both for yourself, for teams and for others. And we're going to hear from uh, Jocelyn, who's been on the course uh, that I'll talk about later in the in in the session who's going to share a, a kind of feelings and the impact of this that this program had on her so um, we want to get you involved we would love you to ask lots of questions in the chat comments suggestions you've got the event action plan so if you can use that that would be fantastic and the session is being recorded and we will share the slides after. We would love, as I say, any of your opinions or thoughts on this. And if we can't pick up on your questions today, we will come back to them after the session. So uh, we're going to do a few different bits, but it's basically about applying neuroscience for managing change. Uh, as I say, Tibisa is here to, uh, work, to present some of today's session and we'll, we'll be switching as we go. So Tibby, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Yo. Um, welcome, everyone, to this session. Um, we're going to make it as fun as possible. I'm sure we'll have some fun, which is the most important part here. And as I Joe said in the beginning, let's go with some of the polls. So let's not delay more um, some of the fun. And what I would like um, to do first is, please, all of you, let's try to imagine um, a situation and really go back um, in your chair and try to embody this experience. Let's imagine you are just going to jump from a plane. We are 10,000 uh, feet above this in the sky, and you are just going to jump. What I would like you is to close your eyes and try to embody that experience. Um, and I would like um, to hear from you um, how does it feel. So, so let's wait one, two seconds for you to actually um, embody the experience. And what we will do is, please, well, let's uh, launch the first poll um, to start to hear from you um, how um, does it feel. Um, I would you to say, well, first, does it feel like my heart bomb fast? It feels excited. Or B, my heart bomb fast, and you know what? It feels terrifying. Or C, I am freeze. There's no way I'm going to jump. Or it could be another option, say, no, no, nothing. So I would like to um, hear from you. Um, and I'm going to launch the poll here. I can see already most of the people say B. My heart beat 
fast. It feels terrifying, however I jump. Oh, it's moving now. Some of you, I think we got about 61%. It feels terrifying, but I jump. About 28% still going on. It feels it feel exciting, but I jump. And about 5%, it says, I'm free, I don't jump. Let's carry one more second since still the poll is going. I think still the one which is high, I can see, is B, where it feels my heart feels a bit fast, it feels terrifying. Two more seconds and we close the, the poll wheel. I can still see something coming in. Great. Uh, one more second, still voting. Ooh, one more coming. Great. So let's leave it here. I think it's about 63% of you say, yes, it feels terrifying. It jump. Oh, I can see one more saying none of them. That's all right. So what I wanted to point out here is um, the more your body, I guess, the more, the easier it is to say how that it feels. But yes, about 60% of you say it feels terrifying. It feels, I suppose, like a threat. However, about 20% of you say, oh, actually, it feels excited. I still feel my heart going fast, but um, it feels uh, excited. Let's shake it. Shake it, shake it. And let's have a second question, which is actually very different, different scenario I want to hear from you. And then we come back and, and try to, to put all this together. What I would like you now is, again, go back, close your eyes, and let's imagine uh, we're planning holidays. Let's imagine all the, um, all the, um, it has been open to be able to travel. There is no more restrictions. And say we are about three weeks away to have our holidays. One month, three weeks away, we are probably booking flights. Um, we are booking hotels. We are planning where the best location, the dream holidays of our life. And I would like you again to embody that experience. Just embody and how does it feel, that anticipation, that hunting of our dream holidays. And again, Will, would you mind to please launch our second poll? And our second poll is about the anticipation. How does it feel? And I would like you to think between it feel exciting, anxious, motivating, or no, none of them, or it's a little bit of all of them. And here we go. I can see about 45% of you, it say, yes, it feel exciting. However, yeah, still about 8% so far anxious, motivating, so it seems to be very much between exciting and motivating. And this is all about chemistry, right? It is very interesting. And yes, all of them that tend to be is a good percent, as they're about 23% signed all of them. Uh, let's wait, still time to vote, a couple of more seconds. How does it feel? Exciting. And this is all about chemistry. Uh, chemistry here involves to start to put some names here. It is all about dopamine. How does it feel this? Um, yes, I can see now. Let's close the poll now. Thank you for participating. And um, yeah, the biggest one is about 53% of you say you feel excited. Um, still a big percentage, 29%. Is, yes, a little bit of mixture of all of them. And about 10%, 9, 10%, that feeling of the float of dopamine, it feels anxious. Thank you. One last imagination. Let's shake it a little bit again. And let's go to the next question. Next scenario. Here we go. Day after we arrive, plane, train, whatever we took in our dream holidays. And uh, let's jump the day that we arrive. And here we are. Don't know where your dream holidays are, on the beach, on the mountain, whatever it is, but you are there. You are truly enjoying and having the pleasure of your holidays. And embody that experience, because it's nice, actually, to have that chemistry in, in our body, right? I love that, having that. 
Let's breathe and again, Will, would you mind to please launch the third poll? And I would like now to hear from you, um, how does it feel? Do you feel relaxed? All of them, euphoric. Do you feel painless? It feels kind of painless. No, not of them. Or I feel all of them. I can see about 50 and 50 percent of you say between relaxing and a little bit of all of them. Ah, more votes coming. How do you feel? How does it feel that moment of the pleasure of enjoyment and being that holidays? Still relaxing seems to be the most common one, but a good amount of you say all of them. Euphoric still because you are there. And depending on the type of holidays that you imagine, also it probably will move between relaxing and euphoric, right? If I'm just reading my book on the beach and that's what I imagine, maybe it's a bit more relaxing. If I'm going on a ski holiday, I'm really euphoric to go and jump quickly, right? Um, but that feeling, that chemistry that it came as a result of this exercise is driven by dopamine sorry, by endorphins. So that is the feeling of the pleasure. And let's close the, the poll now. We get about 56% between relaxing, 19% euphoric, and all of them, a mixture of all of them. And painless is the important one because when we are flow of that level of endorphins, what do endorphins do? is they are, de they are there to deal with the pain. That's the reason why some of us feel like it feels painless and it feels very relaxing. So let me come back um, to close the polls and last polls of the day. Does it feel the same? If I was going to compare, oh, sorry, sorry, I jumped one slide. If I was going to compare both, this anticipation, the planning, the excitement on anxious, and that pleasure, does it feel the same? And this is the last poll. Uh, Will, please, do you mind to launch the last poll? And I would like you to say, did you feel the same during that anticipation when you were flow of what we call the dopamine, when you were planning the holidays, to when you are actually at the moment? And the question number A is no, it feels different more or less the same. And I would like you for the ones of you who say more or less the same, really be aware. If sometimes feel the same, try to focus a little bit in different sensations on the body. Um, but many times it's actually the anticipation also have a little bit of the celebration in an, and we have a little bit of endorphins picking up or we don't know exactly how it senses it. So that it tends to be if we feel the same. And see, yes, it feels the same. Great. I can see about 80% um, of you say, no, it feels different. Um, about 16% feel more. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Will, for sharing the polls. Um, let me just come back um, to you. Um, so. The idea here is uh, very quickly in the last 10 minutes, I just wanted to expose you to different situations. And this is, have in mind, this is only thoughts, but hopefully gave you a little bit of that chemistry. And, it, and we will pick up later uh, on this. But the idea is like what I think or what I do or what I'm planning to do or activities, it releases an intrigue and it trigger certain chemistry in my body, and that chemistry uh, goes together with certain behaviors. And that chemistry uh, is linked to either threat or what we call reward. So I'm uh, not saying anything more at this point, um, and I want uh, Tammy to, to share an example how all this chemistry looks actually using Lego. Tammy, over to you. Thank you, Tibby. Uh, yeah, so we've been exploring how we can use Lego Serious Play to kind of tap into some of this, particularly around work things. We don't often have the time to think about how we feel and what those behaviours that might occur um, because of how we're feeling. Uh, so for those of you who have done Lego Serious Play, this will be quite familiar to you. But 
very, very quickly, when Tibby um, first shared this, this um, kind of example of jumping out of a plane, I built it out of Lego. And this is my model. And it took me maybe 15 seconds tops to put that together. And instantly I knew how I was feeling, what the emotions were associated with those feelings. Um, if you look at the model, the, the whirly bit at the back is just me being very, very dizzy. The red is the sweat on my brow and the yellow bit on my head is uh, just me bricking it, really, <laughs> pun intended. But just, I mean, utter, utter fear for me jumping out of a plane. And just looking at that model again, I can feel those feelings. So I can really tap into the emotions and the feelings that are happening when I think about that. And having done it with my hands, it really allows you to connect with it so you can then work through it. Uh, so we've been really playing around with, with using Lego Sears Play to understand what's going on. It allows you to access your unconscious quickly and easily and understand how your brain is responding. It makes you more aware of your feelings and emotions. So the biology, the endorphins, the the dopamine that Tibby's been talking about but and associate those with the feelings we're having and that means we can start to relate to the unconscious brain the things that's happening without us thinking about it move us to a conscious state and start to create new habits and behaviors and when we're working in a world of constant change you know changes all around as you're all change leaders uh, being able to tap into this and understand it much more uh, is really really good um, skill to have so that's what we're going to kind of talk about through and the program we've developed um, I and mean, you can also use it to trick your brain. You can change how your brain is responding. So I've just got a very, very quick thing I want you all to do now. So a little bit more interaction. I would like you all to get a pencil or a pen. Um, and I'm just going to ask you to copy this, this chat. So put it between your teeth. Don't let your lips touch it. And just hold it there for a few seconds. Now, you might feel a bit silly. You might start giggling a little bit. People around you, if they can, they'll be wondering what you're doing. But really, really quickly, you can trick your brain into thinking you're smiling. Your brain doesn't know if you're smiling for real or if you're just smiling. But your brain will think that you're happy, you're smiling, you're giggling. And the, some of the chemistry will start to shift. So if you're ever feeling glum, do that. And honestly, 10 minutes later, you know, a few seconds later, you'll start to feel much better. If everyone's grumpy at the dinner table tonight, get the kids to do it. If you're having a team meeting and everyone's a little bit miserable, just stick a pencil between your teeth. It will, and the more, if you do it in a group, you will start to giggle for real. But it, you can trick your brain. So having tools and techniques that allows you to tap into how you're feeling and what those emotions are and then have tools to be able to trick your brain into thinking otherwise is massively um, going to shift how how you're able to tackle that constant change and also how you can understand other people and where they might be feeling. So back to you, Tibby. Thank you, Tammy. Um, and, it, and it's great, isn't it? I mean, well, what Tammy is saying, that little trick of the pencil, um, there are many of them um, because um, we behave very much at the moment based on what biology we're having. The trick is how do I make the biology to work for me? Like in the trick that um, Tammy mentioned. Um, and also, is, am I really aware? This is a question I'm asking you to reflect. Are we usually aware what kind of biology is playing on me? Even if we don't put a name of it, because we don't need to know if it's dopamine or endorphin, but knowing a little bit of them and knowing how we can trigger some of this biology purposely by tricking our brain, we can actually help to um, facilitate change, which is um, the topic of today. Um, before we start to talk a little bit of how it looks change in the brain, um, what I want to point out now from the brain perspective is our brain or the purpose of the brain, the reason why God evolution, um, whatever we believe on, gave us a brain, is actually to help us with the perpetuation of the species. And what does it mean is it helps us first to survive, so it helps us to protect from, from threat, but also it helps us to reproduce and to carry on perpetuating through times. As a result, our brain is hardwired. All the functions that we have in there is the, the brain will make a code 
and we'll see, well, this is, if perceive it, this is a threat or this is a reward. That's it, almost 99% of every perception that we have, our brain will call it threat or reward. And with that in mind is that uh, I would like you to introduce you a little bit of how change actually look in the brain and how we usually approach, uh, traditionally has been approaching change. Um, and it is, why? Because um, change usually is perceived by our brain as a threat. What we say, we call it, is a threat, is reward. And most of the time, 99.9%, .9 our brain perceives it as a threat. Why? Here are the big whys. First, because change consumes a lot and lot of energy. Um, usually, our brain um, consumes a lot of energy on its own. It's about 25% uh, of the total energy that we consume goes to the brain. And that's the reason why the brain makes as many things automatic as possible. What tends to happen is change means consumption of energy. And as a result, our brain sees, it, ooh, there is consumption of energy, this is threat. Why? Because I'm threat of survival. Also, why does the brain see change as a threat? Well, because our brain also has function and it has been coded to detect anything going out of ordinary. It's there to detect any error. And as a result, it will send an error signal via the amygdala, which it will release the chemistry of cortisol and adrenaline and non-adrenaline. And this is a little bit based on the example that we have earlier. We were going to jump from the plane. This is this detection of, oh, this is not ordinary jump out of the brain. So it released the adrenaline and non-adrenaline. And depending of how it has been coding and the memory that we've been having of that experience, we will see it as a threat, or we will see it as an excitement, but it still is excitement as a result of the chemistry of the, of the threat, and this is very important. And the other part of why we are very resistant to, to change as well is because the brain has a full function of the detect pain. And if my perception of change is like it's painful, then it will also release the chemistry of the pain. Why do we say that? Because if we only learn these basics, and here we are only learning about some of the chemistry, which is uh, adrenaline on adrenaline, and now a little bit of what we learned earlier for the reward, is by learning that we can move more into a brain-friendly approach to change. Um, can I ask you, sorry, Tammy, if we uncover the brain-friendly approach? So how does the brain-friendly approach look like? Is if there is anything I can do to save energy out of this change, that will definitely facilitate change. Right. So I can do either two things. One of them is how do I do to save energy or how do I do purposely to have some chemistry like adding a little bit of dopamine so I can give you energy. And the idea um, of, of this program and, and the idea, the intention of introducing you with a little bit uh, of neuroscience is to say what tricks can I do to add energy to my brain? to release a little bit of dopamine. What tricks can I do to save energy so I release less adrenaline and cortisol? That's the first part. The second part also to facilitate uh, the change is, what can I do out of all these, out of ordinary, all the mess that is going on in a change? Uh, what can I do to add a little bit of familiarity? Can I? do anything systematically to add a pattern recognition, like dealing in chunk, in a small chunks of change, for example. That will add a little bit of pattern recognition. So here, the reflection to you is, what can I do to add some familiarity so the amygdala will 
go lower. We count the level of the amygdala. And the last part, and this is coming back to chemistry, what can I do to deal with pain? And as we know, endorphins as a chemistry is there to deal with pain. If we manage to flow our brain with endorphins, like in the example of the holidays, uh, then we manage to actually see the situation and uh, let it be painless with a bit more relaxation. And there are tricks that we can release endorphins. I mean, the most common trick is running. That's the, whole, that's the reason why when we do a lot of sport and running, um, we release endorphins. And it helps us to go through with any pain that we might be having in our life or, or at work. But there are other tricks more related to uh, f through the organization. Balancing what we saw earlier, which is what I call the brain reward system, which is anticipation with the pleasure is very important finding what I get the balance, what I call the balance or the sweet spot between the dopamines and the pleasure is a key element to facilitate change. Why? Because we provide energy, which is the dopamine, in a sustainable way by also providing endorphins and not get into the snowball of just being anticipation and in the excitement and just working and working and we don't release any endorphins. Um, so um, that is why knowing about our biology helps us a lot to think systematically what we can do to facilitate change. And why is all this important to be in what I call a more rewarded state? which is what you can see here on the screen within the green uh, area, is because beam flow of dopamine, endorphin, and another uh, peptide, neuropeptide called oxytocin, which is not really part of the brain reward system, but it comes as a modulator of it. Once we are flow of that chemistry, our behavior change. Only physically, physiologically, by beam flow of it, we feel much more excited. We feel much more collaborative between. We feel like we trust each other. We bond to each other. We feel much more pleasure and everything feels painless. That's the reason why if we build a model systematically to move from a threat system into a more rewarded state, we help to facilitate change. And that movement, that sweet spot, as I call it, cannot be 100% in a rewarded state because we need part of the chemistry of what it gives us from being in threat. We need that non-adrenaline to make us alert, right? So the idea is to find really the right sweet spot, depending of my, what my intention is in a project or in life. What chemistry purposely should I promote or not? Hope uh, it makes sense. Um, so what I want to do is, um, Tammy, to you a little bit. With it. Thank you, Tibby. Um, so yes, based on all of that and a challenge by Joe, we put together a program which brings all this together. So um, it's, you know, it's got lots of Lego series playing. It's very practical, hands-on. You can explore how you feel and your emotions uh, straight away. You can go and try it out. And we've been running it with, with some of the teams in HEE. And it's basically, it's an eight module program, a seven, eight week program with seven modules. And we start with that plane. We start with understanding those kind of emotions and feelings and tapping into some of that. We then work through uh, what your uh, inherent strengths are. So your, it's almost like your values really, what, what is important to you and how can you bring those to change? How can you maximize their use? before moving into fixed and growth mindset. So when you're faced with change, you might shut down, you might say you can't do it, you might not be interested, you might think it's too hard, you might be too busy. How can you shift into being into a much more growth mindset where you're more curious to, to explore and to learn and to embrace that change uh, and tapping into, and again, we use Lego Series Play to really tap into that and you, you get instant results with the Lego. You, you really start to understand things in a different way. We then move into the, the social pain, which Tibby mentioned. So, you know, physical pain and social pain, the brain perceives them in the same way. So using something called the scarf model, we can explore what are the pain, what is, what's the pain doing to us? What is it that we're, we're 
that's causing that pain in our brain and how can we offset that using the scarf model and not just for us but for other people as well so if we're trying to you know you're having to lead change and bring senior people and teams and lots of different people on board with your change they might be feeling pain from that so how can you use this scarf model to to understand what they're going through so that you can offset it and shift them to a better place and finally we move into something called hunting and laughing which is around the dopamine and endorphin and getting that balance and finding ways to do that creating you know this this the, the smile with the pencil the celebratory dance lots of things that we work through um with the different tools that give you the tools you can go away and use straight away people that have been on the program have, have gone through you know after a session they've gone and put things into practice so by the end of the course you really are equipped to deal with this the final module on um, the program is actually taking a real scenario that we take from your sponsor so something that really could happen that could could be quite bad for you or for other people might feel quite a threat uh, and work through it backwards so we start with what are the small actions and new habits you can develop to create the endorphins and the dopamine the do you know the tick list the celebratory dance what is the pain that you might feel use the scarf model to recognize what the pain might be and how you can offset that Moving into how can we have a growth mindset around this? How can we get rid of the blockers to learning and make that shift? So we want to embrace it and really learn from it. Just not just for us again, but for other people as well that we're trying to lead through the change. What are the strengths that we have that we can lend to this? What strengths are missing in our team, perhaps, that we might want to borrow from and how will we build in actions to do that? And finally, we come back to that that the plain thing again, how are you feeling? What are the emotions? And um, what do others feel? And trying to shift. So at the start, when we present the scenario, we've had a few eek moments and people have been really, really uncomfortable. But as we've worked backwards through the model with the tools that we've we've learned over the, the course of the program, we've got to a point where actually it feels okay and we know what we need to do. And we know what each other's strengths are that we can lend from. And as a team, we can embrace this and we can work through it. So the feelings at the end so far <laughs> might fail, of course, and you might still be afraid to jump out of that plane. But what we've got to so far is everybody's just felt in a much more equipped position, not only to manage your own feelings and emotions, but to manage those in the team and support the team. There's greater understanding across the team and also have a much better collaborative effect effort to go out and help other people through their change and lead through change to remove that fear so that's it very very quickly in a nutshell but we can share more if you are interested um, after this and, and try and answer any questions but we're now going to go and hear from Jocelyn who's been on the program and get your thoughts and your experiences so over to you Joss and Tibby. Tibby. Yeah, thank you, Tammy. And thank you, Jocelyn, um, for being here uh, with us. Um, and the idea is to share, as Tammy said, a little bit of your experience. You came to this program. We made you play a little bit with your chemistry. We made you, we trick our brains during about six weeks, right? Um, and I would like to, if, if possible, for you to share with, with the participants today, what do you think it was that it helped you the most for learning about neuroscience? What helped you the most? Wow, very good question. Um, quite deep to begin with, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, just the, the whole subject of neuroscience was completely new to me, to be honest. Um, I found every week I was kind of looking forward to the sessions to, to find out what we would cover um, in them because, you know, I love constantly learning. Um, and I think just the pure fact that you can actually kind of have more control of your brain than you think, um, that you can actually trick it to believe, um, you know, kind of the opposite of what you're, you're feeling and going through at that time. Um, I think that's quite powerful, um, especially when you're, you're kind of not just working, you know, with, with yourself, uh, but with teams. Um, as a change manager, when you're working with different groups of stakeholders, um, it's kind of really utilising the, the learnings from the course um, you know, to kind of dig down into that deeper level. Um, we all know that, you know, you need to empathise with people. You need that deeper understanding of what people are going through. How are they feeling? How are we going to manage to get them along the full, the full change journey? Um, so, yeah, obviously learning all about kind of B 
being able to, to increase levels um, of, of endorphins and, and making sure they balance um, with the dopamine. I, I think it's all really relevant um, and really beneficial. Oh, thank you, Jocelyn. And we are probably about three weeks now that we finish. So it's still a little bit recent. And, and I hope you can still try to, to play, to play those tricks that, that we went through in, <laughs> in the program. And it's become, I think, as, as we mentioned in the program, right, it becomes almost building a habit of saying, oh, let me pick up a little bit of these endorphins to feel more relaxed, right? Let's do a little bit more of the celebration part. Let's celebrate a bit more, right? Yeah. I, and I think that was one of your favorite, right, Jocelyn, the, <laughs> the endorphin part, because it feels relaxed, that's what we, we kind of need. Thank <laughs> you. Um, one more question, Jocelyn. Uh, what part of the program, um, through what Tammy also explained, um, you found most useful for you um, to, especially when you are dealing with change. What, what was your favorite part, and you've been probably using the most so far? Ooh, again, it's, it's difficult to pick out one element of it because I think it all complements kind of what what we do and what we're trying to achieve. Um, I don't know if me potentially I'd be swayed towards something like the scarf model because um, that was something completely new. Um, and, and again, it's when you're working with that group of people, it's, it, it's recognizing what elements or what domains of that model um, actually come in to play at that point in time um, and, and kind of highlighting any gaps there might be um, and what other domains you can bring in maybe from other people and other stakeholders um, to kind of ensure that, you know, you, you get to where you, you need to be. Um, but yeah, I, I think the full program was, was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you very much. Um, and and it, it went kind of unwrapping. I, I guess at one point in the, in the program, uh, we were talking this with, with Jocelyn, is, is building the habit of it, right? Is how we systematically actually build the habit of it. Um, thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, Tammy, I don't know if um, you have any other question for Jocelyn that you would like to ask or we give it to the audience. Um, just one quick one. I was just yes. wondering uh, around the team because uh, we I know you came to a program that wasn't your team, Jocelyn, but there was a massive shift, I think, in how the team were kind of responding to each other as we went through the program in a really good way. I just wondered if you had any comments or thoughts on that as an observer and being part of that. Yeah, I mean, it was fantastic to be able to join that that, that particular team. Um, and, and like you say, I think from a little bit of an outsider's point of view, it was, it was nice to see them kind of develop as individuals, but also as a team. I think they became a lot more open. Um, I, I think they were quite kind of gelled together anyway. But I think by the end of the, the programme, you could see that they would be more than willing to kind of support each other and, yeah. and be there and, yeah, be able to, to kind of highlight strengths and, and where other people might be able to come in and, and help with that. Um, so, yeah, I think they did great. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. Joe, do we have any questions from, from the audience? Hey there. Yes, we do. And everybody's loved the session. They've, they've um, they found it really fascinating. And uh, there's lots of much happier people now that they've had their pencils <laughs> in their mouth. Um, there's some people who are in the session who are part of the WhatsApp group and they've been posting pictures of themselves <laughs> with the pencils. I'm hoping we'll see some of that on the activity wall later so that we can, uh, we can all have a a good laugh about it but um no there's some really good questions and there were some really um some really good insights from people in terms of how how they were sort of responding to it um so let me just get the first question up um so um the question with the most votes at the moment is uh how can we use this knowledge of brain chemistry for positive change with reluctant stakeholders <laughs> we all struggle with that one. yeah right i'm struggling with that yes um, what I, we, we mentioned is that the chemistry works both ways, right? So if you manage to get the right chemistry in the reluctant stakeholders, you already have a step win there, right? So the idea is just on how play with the chemistry of your stakeholders so they are much more open for you to influence them from a positive perspective. Right now, how can we uh, help other people to release certain chemistry? 
Um, and, and an example is, um, it is, say, if I'm going to meet um, a, a someone who is very resistant as a stakeholder, maybe I just take uh, 30 seconds to actually increase their status. How do they feel? I give a good importance to them when I kind of help them to increase their status because probably they are very resistant because they have a fear somehow that their status will go down. So by doing that, I already playing with the chemistry in that sense. Also, if I take a few seconds to actually release on endorphins in these people, then they will feel less pain especially during 30 minutes. If, how do I do for, the, for these stakeholders to support the, the release of endorphins? Maybe I start with some laughing. Once I start the meeting, I start to laugh. Um, I start to put some music, depending on the situation, if it's possible or not. Why? Because we know that laughter release a lot of endorphins. So only by doing that and to dedicate system, and, and in a way we always do that. We start a difficult meeting and somehow we start with a joke. The idea here is to do it systematically, purposely. And in that way, um, we put the right chemistry in the people who are resistant. These are some of the examples. I hope um, very shortly, Joe, that kind of answered. Um, yeah, no, no, right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'd, I'd learned this um, because when, when I did the course, that was one of the things that stood out for me. I used this um, just for those amongst us um, last week with somebody who was going to be very resistant to something we were doing. Um, and part of it was acknowledging that at the start, that they felt out of their comfort zone. And because we got them to acknowledge they felt out of their comfort zone, A, we could sort of de-fear it for them and put some things in place but also I've then arranged to do some follow-ups with some fun things so that it, it, it doesn't seem daunting anymore um, and they, they've sort of come back very positively and I think if I can follow that up and, and chunk up those little activities uh, we were talking about playing some games and things to um, uh, to get them to enjoy the experience of, of this new thing that they're uh, uh, afraid of so that that was a really really helpful insight for me I have to say. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Joe. Um, and yes, I think that that's, it is. That is the power of the chemistry, right? So we have a follow-up question, um, <laughs> which says, an understanding of activities to produce brain chemistry sounds great, but I imagine it could be very easy to get wrong. And what further, further learning could, would you recommend uh, so we don't unintentionally cause the opposite effect? <laughs> that's a great question because I would actually say most of the day today we make the wrong chemistry in others with how we actually realize in it, right? So um, the fact that we don't know and we just act in life and even when we are so much in, because we are set on times and we are too much in the hurry, only arriving in this to a meeting, you are ready to create maybe the wrong chemistry. Um, as, as you say, not the one that we purposely want. Um, so definitely learning a little bit of different neurotransmitters, learning like endorphins give you a little bit of painless, learning that non-adrenaline put you alert, learning that adrenaline made you fast movement. So learning a little bit, and that is where the power of learning our neuroscience comes, because you try to make it a bit more right. It doesn't mean you're not making it wrong, because it's very hard to control 100%. It's very utopic to control all the chemistry. Chemistry also comes from food, from our day-to-day -day life. But if at least systematically we do activities, thoughts, and behaviors that put you in the right direction, I don't think we, we get it a bit more right rather than totally wrong. Okay, so uh, the next one is, is similar. So what techniques would you recommend to overcome resistance to organizational change? Now that's much less about one individual, that's about a whole organization. So how would you approach that? I would approach in trying to create, and that's where organizational designs and processes comes very important, is what kind of processes do I put in place to promote, for example, oxytocin? And that is was um, kind of a, not really easy, but very practical. We know that oxytocin is released by sense of belonging. What can I do in terms of organizational uh, practices to increase the sense of belonging? 
that is a quick example. So I would say is by looking at the organizational design, but, and that's how change management function is so key to know about neuroscience, is because by knowing about that, together with the other processes of change management, we can implement some what we call brain-friendly practices in the processes. So that I sounds think, really good. Yeah. So I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm just mindful that we've run out of time oh, and there's so I'm much sorry. more to learn about this. But <laughs> this is really great. We have another couple of questions which we will put to you both and we'll feed back to um, uh, all the attendees afterwards to make sure that we get the most out of this. It's been absolutely fascinating. And having been on the course, I know how much of a difference it's made for me. And, and I just even love sort of going over it again. It's really great to, uh, to revisit some of that. And I know that people in the um, session have had uh, a, a really good time as well, really interesting fascinating insights. So thank you very much, uh, TB, for, for your insights around the neuroscience. Thank you, Tam, for your ins insights around applying that to change management and the tools and techniques and bringing that together in uh, the session today. And thank you, Joss, for sharing your experiences with us. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody. And then just lastly, in terms of um, the end of the session, don't forget to um, do the uh, fill in the survey uh, and give your feedback on the session and your thoughts and comments. Really important for us to understand that. And then you've got a lunch break now. Um, so uh, have some time, get, get some of the things done in terms of um, do some of the quizzes, um, uh, you know, respond to the surveys, make sure we do the networking and connections with each other. Stick a pencil in your mouth and just make keep, keep being happy. Um, Next up, we've got um, lunch menu, and there's a choice of three different events. They're all on Teams. Uh, you can pick whichever one you're particularly interested in, but also they will all be recorded. So obviously, if you can't make all of them, you can come back. Um, the recordings will be on the platform to, for you to catch up with afterwards. So without further ado, sorry for running over a little bit there, but thank you so much. Again, fantastic session, really inspiring. And um, see you all uh, after the lunch break. <laughs>